Well, good morning, everybody. We want to welcome you here as you um, come to worship with us. Um, I don't know about you guys, but seeing the sunshine and outside sure makes it uh, a little easier to take the cold. I'm, I'm pretty cold-blooded most of the year, so uh, when it gets cold, I, I really like to see the sunshine outside because it makes it not feel quite so cold. But anyway, that was just something that I was thankful for this morning. Um, if you guys would join us standing, um, we're going to sing I Stand Amazed. Um, it is number 223 in your hymnals if you want to follow along that way. And we are singing verses 1, 2, and 5. Verse 10, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And the reason that I wanted to read that for you this morning is because when we think about his great love and his grace and his mercy, we have more than 10,000 reasons to praise him.
our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us the time here together. And we thank you for all the things that you've given us, the big things that we think of, the things that come to mind instantly, such as family, friends, a home, clothing, food, and the things that sometimes we take for granted. We might, well, we might take for granted some of those things, but some of the smaller things that we overlook sometimes. Father, I thank you for everything you've given us. And for this time now, as we take our offering, I pray for the things we have uh, to offer you back. Um, whatever we give, Lord, I pray that it is with a thankful heart, with a, great, with a grateful heart, and that you would use um, the gifts to increase your kingdom and that we might continue to do your kingdom work. Thank you so much. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
our heart's prayer, that we are ready for you, we're longing for you, and not that we're just sitting idly by waiting, but that, that we are working and that we're serving you, and we're about your business. We want to be pure and holy when we come and be your bride. Thank you, Father, for making us your church, for adopting us, for welcoming us, accepting us. Lord, you are awesome, you are great. You are the everlasting God. You are the Prince of Peace. And Father, this morning we just want to come before you, acknowledging that you are God. We love you. Thank you so much for loving us. 
how deep your love is for us. We don't even, can't even comprehend that. And yet you love us that much. So we just thank you for what you're going to do, what you have done, how you have touched lives. And we ask in the remainder of the service that your Holy Spirit would be allowed to keep working, keep touching lives, keep transforming us and making us more like him. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I didn't want to jump up here too fast because I wanted that to settle in a little bit. It was wonderful, wasn't it? Amen. Amen. When I was in college, I took a course on music listening. The name of the course was called, not music appreciation, but listening to music. Any of you take that course? Same like a no-brainer, you know. What do you do in that class? Listen to music. So I, I enrolled in the class there, and while we were in there, it was actually pretty difficult for me. I don't have a musical background, and um, some of the things we had to do is we had to listen to different instruments, and then we'd listen to songs that were being played there, or, you know, a lot of it was classical stuff. And they'd play it, and they'd say, you know, identify that instrument. You have to tell us what instrument that was. And I didn't know the difference between an oboe and a clarinet or a flute or any of that sort of stuff. And, and so I had to learn. We had to learn about um, the different musical um, music that came out of different um, uh, times, historical times there. So there was Baroque music, there was Romance music, there was the classical period, all that sort of stuff. We had to listen to Gregorian chants and just kind of understand how all that worked, what, what the different uh, things were that identified that or sig were significant <laughs> in that particular, quote unquote, genre of music. So I learned a little bit about music. I didn't know anything about music before, but I learned about it. One of the things I really remember in, in, that, in that class was we had to listen in, uh, I, I learned to listen, I, I learned to appreciate the, the song Canon in D, right? And so it's very um, famous, Pachelbel's Canon. And so um, we'd listen to that, and the teacher would point out, listen to this, listen to this, listen to this. And so we're listening to these stringed instruments, and they're, they're plucking, called pizzicato, right? And they're plucking there, the strings, and all of a sudden it keeps on plucking, plucking. I know. If I get excited about it, it's only because I learned something that I never knew before, <laughs> and now I get to share it with you. And so they're plucking these strings there, and he says, listen, 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 because all of a sudden the plucking changes, and it goes into bowing, and it just blends into that. And once I heard that for the first time, it was like, whoa, I, I, I got something, you know. I, I know it. I can, I, can, I can tell when it's happening. And I was so excited because I knew something about music, okay. So the class was good for me, all right. I learned how to listen to music. I learned to appreciate music a lot more. And um, I say that to you because as I was thinking this week and I was listening to I was watching a video, and this guy was telling people how to play a song. He was teaching them how to play a song on a, a, a musical instrument. And he says, I'm going to play it in this different key because people, some of the guys can't sing in this other key. So I'm going to make it so that everybody can sing it. And I thought that was, that was good because so many times there are songs that, You know, and, and, and some people can sing that and some people can't, you know. And so when, um, and so when it's for everybody to, to be able to, to sing it, um, I thought it was a good move there. And I was, uh, I was thinking about that and just preparing for the sermon today. Um, I came across a psalm that I think encourages everyone to praise our great God for his glorious goodness. It encourages all of us, each one, everyone is supposed to do this. And so it's not something that's just for the special people. It's not just something for the elite who can praise God. It's something that all of us should do and all of us can do. And so I want to encourage you to uh, turn right now to Psalm 
145 in your Bibles. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible, there might be one on the rack in the chair in front of you. Uh, if you have digitals, those are fine. Just, those are fine too. Just don't email and iMessage and all that sort of stuff in, during the service time, okay? Even if you're saying amen, okay? That, I mean, that might distract me. I'll feel my phone going off or something like that. And then, oh, someone's trying to get in touch with me, okay? So uh, Psalm 145. And I entitled the sermon Praise in G, okay? Not because I understand musical uh, uh, um, what do they call that, the key of G or any of that sort of stuff. I don't understand all of that, but I thought it was G. G was good because um, all the points in this outline will have the letter G in them somewhere or another, okay? And that came out of the, that came out of the text, okay? Let's read Psalm 145, and then I'll share some comments on it, okay? Psalm 145, a song of praise of David I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his works and kind in all his works. Faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. This Psalm 145, I didn't realize it until I got into the study of it this week, that actually used a lot in uh, different traditions, different uh, uh, denominations, used this in their, their worship books, if you will. As a matter of fact, they used this psalm, it's the reading, on four separate Sundays out of the year. How about that, huh? And um, it's uh, something that we don't get into English here, but in the original language, it's actually an acrostic. It takes the letter of each letter from the Hebrew alphabet and gives one line to that. And so it goes through in alphabetical order there, partly because it's a good way to remember the, the ways of God and the things of God. You see this in Psalm 119. If you look at those little letters on top of that, I don't know if you're aware of that or not, but those are actually Hebrew letters. And so they, they lay out the Hebrew letters there, Psalm 119, and each one of those little sections of the psalm represents, is, is represented by one of those letters, and it goes through and just kind of uh, uh, gives these, and each line in those, those ones start with that letter too. So in a way, it's kind of rest, you know, constraining, but at the same time, it, 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 it keeps it so that people can remember Number one. And number two, it gives the idea of a completeness or a comprehensiveness to who God is. In Psalm 119 in particular, it's about God's word. In Psalm 145, it's going to be about the praise of God. It's kind of interesting there. It's that idea, right? From A to Z, right? We're praising the Lord. So this is a, a psalm of David. And actually, it says a song of praise of David it's the only psalm in all of the book of Psalms 
that start off with this word, this, this song of praise. Specifically, this way, and it says, the, the Hebrew word is tehillah. But no other psalm starts off like that. Kind of cool. See, you don't get that in the English, right? Because afterwards, you get all these other ones that talk about praising the Lord, praising the Lord, praising the Lord. But none of them start off like this. So it's a song of praise. It's a song of David, okay? Um, the first point, I guess we should get into that, huh? Because you're probably wondering why that empty mark is there. And I'll give it to you here. I do have this on, and we will. And I wait, I wait for you. <laughs> no? Is it locked? Okay. There it is. Okay. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. I wanted it to be up there. I have it here, but you won't have it there So until we get it there. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised. So it says here, as David writes this, he says, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. So as he as he's saying this, he's using a lot of different words to say the same sort of thing. I will extol you. He says, I will bless you. I will praise you. Uh, I will praise your name. Uh, I will bless you. So the idea here is he's kind of overwhelmed with the sense of who God is. Or at least he's committing himself to that in such a way that he says, I'm going to do this. I will do this. I will do this. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. So great is the Lord and greatly to be praised is, is what David is saying here. And it's something that as he's writing this down, you know, he was creating a songbook that became the songbook of the church, or at least of the Hebrews, I should say, of the Israelites. It became their songbook. It became the things that they would do when they gathered together. They would read these or sing these songs and they would encourage one another. They would remind each other of who God is and why they're all gathered together. And it's been preserved for us. We have it too. We get to use it as well. And so we write lots of our songs coming out of this book of songs, also known as the Psalms. And so David says here that I will extol my God and King. I will bless your name forever. So he's addressing God even as he's writing this. He's calling God my God, my, my king. And he's addressing it to God. And then he, as the psalm kind of goes through, it, it talks of an address directly to God. And then it talks about, generally speaking, an attribute of God or something about God. And he kind of panels that through. So you see it through 1 through 3. You see it through verses 4 through 13. You kept pick a uh, word. 4 through 13, you pick up again in verse 14 and goes down through 21. And so he says something good and he talks about who God is. Says something good about God, talks about who God is. You know, says a, a reason why God is great and then talks about who God is. So he says here, our God is great. Great is the Lord in verse 3 and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. And when it talks about unsearchable, it doesn't mean that you can't search out God. It just means you're never going to come to a complete, comprehensive understanding about who God is because he's infinite, and it makes sense it should be that way. We tend to want a God or tend to want to understand things so that we have a mastery over those things, so that we think, hey, I know this inside and outside, inside and out, you know, was it inside out? Yeah, I guess that's how it is. I know it all front to back and, and back to front and all that sort of thing, and I got control of it. But it's not like that with God. So we think about here, David's talking about how great God is. His greatness is unsearchable. And you just think about this idea of even as he's, as he's declaring this, he has a sense of awesomeness of who God is. God is awesome. The next point here, he goes on to say here in verse, picks up in verse 4, but I'll give you the next point. It says, God's glorious goodness endures throughout all generations. It's just, a, it's just a point in here that should cause us to think about who God is, cause us to think about his greatness, cause us to think about the bigness of God, if you will. 
We have problems in our lives, and those problems are huge to us. And we think, oh, you know, the things I go through are so big, they're just too big. And sometimes we think they're too big for God. And we think that he's not sovereign even over those things. And so we need to be reminded of the eternality of God. So verse 4 says here that one generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness, it says here in the psalm. So one generation shall commend your works to another. This is the idea of God's glorious goodness enduring uh, throughout all generations. One generation gets to declare it to another. In David's case, he's, it's his generation. His generation. He's the one who's writing this stuff out. He's the one who's, who's, who's putting this song together, and it's going to be declared to the next generation. But it says here that we, we find out at the end of verse uh, 7, it talks about... Um, I'm sorry. As, it going, as it's going through here, it, it talks about... Um, the idea of an everlasting kingdom that God has when we get to verse 13. And it just talks about how this endures, yeah, God's dominion endures throughout all generations, it tells us in verse 13. So the thing is, as David's writing this and he's declaring that, sometimes we, we, we say that he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, but did he have a full comprehension of what would what would what God would do with what he was doing at that point in time so that we would be reading this psalm here thousands of years later and looking to God and giving him praise for it. See, we don't think like that. We say that God is eternal. We say that God can do great things, but sometimes we don't think that God will use what we are doing for something that goes on for a long, 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 long time. Well, Part of the reason we don't think like that is because we know that we are in the last days, right? The last days? Yeah, that's what Peter said in Acts chapter 2 at the day of Pentecost. He said, we're in the last days, you know? So we know we're in the last days. And so sometimes we think, well, you know, it, the Lord is coming back. We, we sang it. You know, we're, we, we're expecting that. We want the Lord to come back. We're supposed to pray for that. We're supposed to desire that. But what if his timing's not our timing? As it usually isn't, right? How many times does God fit right into your schedule? I mean, you lay it all out and say, this is how it's going to go, boom, boom, boom. And God comes along and says, that's exactly how I wanted it to go. There's usually a little bit of a kind of a hiccup along the way, right? And so... You kind of have to think like that there, that his timing might be different. And so we might, what's taking place right now, the things that we're doing, how he's using us, would be things that might go on for generation to generation to generation to generation. Uh, we were talking about that. Uh, one, of the, one of the deacons and I were just having a conversation about that. And we're thinking about Abraham, you know. And you think about Abraham and God gives him this promise and says, hey, you know, you're going you're gonna to have, you know, like the sand on the seashore, like the stars in the sky, you're going to have offspring like that. And God tells him this right when he was 75. And then, you know, 11 years later, right, he's kind of, oh, no, this is not going to, this is not happening. It's not happening. 11 years, that's a long time, isn't it? Especially when you're 75 and you're supposed to have your first child. Right? That's a long time to think about it. And so he's like, well, this is, you know, I'm not sure how this is all working out. And then God, you know, reassures him, no, you're going to have a child. And not only that, he's going to come from your, come from you, Abraham. He's going to be your child. Not like you're going to, your servant. It's going to be, he's going to be your child. And then later on, he tells him, it's not just your child. It's going to come from Sarah too, right? And so he has to wait till he's 100 for that one. 
And so, you know, we think about the timing of things, and we say, it's got to be just like this. It's got to happen, you know. We see the signs here. There's wars. There's rumors of wars. There's all this sorts of stuff there. You know, Israel, the budding of the fig tree in 1948 and all that sort of stuff. And so we kind of nail all that down and say, it has to happen. But do we really understand the bigness of God and his thinking? The reason I say that is because I don't want anybody going out and selling all their stuff. Why would you sell all your stuff if the Lord is coming back anyway? <laughs> you can't take it with you, right? So, you know, so, you know we, 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 don't, we think like that. We kind of limit God, but maybe it's because sometimes the load we carry is pretty heavy. And we say, I don't know if I can hang on this long. And do you know the good thing about it is as we turn to the Lord, he gives us the strength to hang on. It's not in our own strength that we do it. As we're talking about praising the Lord and one generation commending the works of another shall declare your mighty acts, and we talk about how great God is, sometimes we don't feel like we really want to do that, especially as we're coming into Thanksgiving. What do I have to be thankful for? Jermaine prayed there. You know, the usual, we got, we got family, we got food, we got shelter, we have clothing. Those are good things, right? But if you say God is really good, don't, don't you get challenged by that and say, you know, come on, God, can't you do a little better than just that? I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be presumptuous here. I'm just saying that that's if you, you know, when somebody says they're good, you expect it to be good. If you came to my house and told me you could cook really well and you put out a hot dog in a bun, I'm going to be like, you know, what's up with this, right? You said you could deliver. And so when we think about that, we, we sometimes think maybe God, we wonder about his goodness, how great his mighty acts are. You know, if you're having difficulty in your marriage. Is God really good, you might ask. Maybe your kids, you have adult children who aren't following the Lord. Is God really good? Maybe your health is terrible. Is God really good? Maybe you suffered with all these different things. Is God really good? And so the question comes up there. How do we deal with that? How do we genuinely praise God and be thankful when we're not really thankful in our hearts at times? And the thing is, we have to ask God to change that in us. It's nice to muster up a lot of strength and say, I'm going to praise the Lord. That's good. But God needs to change our hearts if it's going to be authentic and genuine, right? So this is what David is talking about here. When he's saying one generation to the next, that first generation, man, they talk about all the things that God did for them. It was fantastic. Oh, we didn't have anything, and we started with a little this, this. You know, we were in this little shack, and we met together as a church, and we, you know, God was faithful, and now, you know, the Lord blessed us, and he did this, you know. I have those stories too, you know. You go back and say, yeah, we started in the storefront and we did this and we didn't know what we were doing. And look now what God has done and we prayed for a gym and God gave us three gyms. And, you know, you just go through all that sort of stuff. And, you, and then the next generation is like, so what? You know, that's what happened to you, you know. I start with that. How does it get better for me? Right? And sometimes that's how we measure it, the stuff that we have. Here, David is talking about here, uh, verse 7. Oh, wow, how did I get so far ahead? Can we go back to verse 7? Thanks. Verse 7 says, They shall pour forth the, the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. After it talks about here what's going to happen in terms of praising the Lord, Then it talks about who God is. Verse 8 says, The Lord is gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. This is the same thing that 
God revealed to Moses in Exodus chapter 32. When Moses said, show me your glory, right? And the Lord passed by and said, the Lord, the Lord, you know, is gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that that he has made. So verse 8 is the one here that the Lord is gracious and he's merciful. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Talking about the character of God. And do we believe that? Yeah, sometimes we believe that, and sometimes we don't want to believe that. You know, Jonah used this verse there, and he prayed it back to God in in Jonah chapter 4. He says, I know you're like this. Remember when God delivered the Ninevites? They repented. He says, I know you're like this. You're steadfast. You're slow to anger. You're you're steadfast in love here. You're merciful. You're gracious. And, And Jonah didn't want God to be that way because it was towards the Ninevites. It's okay if it's towards me. But what about the Ninevites, right? What about our quote-unquote enemies? Do we want the Lord to be gracious to them? Do we want the Lord to be steadfast and merciful, slow to anger? Okay for me, right? What about those who are slow to come around? And we're not sure if they even will come around. Are we, are we still going to praise the Lord for, 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 for that and hope, uh, put our hope in the Lord for, for that change too? I know it's kind of, some of this is kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to, to bring out because if you struggle with something there, then it's hard to see God's goodness. The Lord is good to all, it says in verse 9, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall praise, all your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. So part of it is that we need to have an eternal perspective on things, too. It's not that God hasn't done good things in our lives. He has. And if you think about these mighty acts that David is talking about, he's usually referring to some sort of deliverance that has taken place in his life. Some sort of deliverance from the hand of Saul. Maybe deliverance in the battle. Maybe uh, 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 deliverance from uh, in, in uh, the past of, of the Israelites. The, you know, what they, what they had to deal with in the salvation even from from the bondage of Pharaoh in Egypt. And so this idea of deliverance is what has God delivered us from? See, if you think about it, if you start to say, well, I think my life should be like a movie star, then yeah, you're going to say God's not really that good because I'm not that, right? But if we think about what we're supposed to be, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, right? What are we deserving of? It's a lot less than what God has given us in salvation. Did you follow that? And so we talk about giving thanks to the Lord and for his goodness. His goodness to us is that we say, well, if you grew up maybe in a good family and you didn't have a lot of difficulties in your life, then sometimes we think, well, you know, All that is just because my parents made wise decisions, you know, and I just lived a good life. But if we think about being adopted into God's family from being basically an orphan, is how the scripture puts it, we're adopted into his family as his children, then then we can see the goodness of God. We can recognize that, at least a little bit anyway. Sometimes we don't give praise to God or thanks to God because we think it's all because of what I've done. You know, my family, my life has gone well because I have made wise decisions. I have made wise economic decisions. I have chosen to send my kids to school. I have made these things because I'm pretty smart, you know. I'm pretty wise. Just think about your life. 
Think about the decisions you've made. Think about the times when you've messed up royally. And it didn't, it didn't take you completely under. You know what I mean? Like relationships maybe, you know, with your, with your spouse, some of the things that you've said. And that the fact that maybe she's forgiven you or he's forgiven you or things that you've done. And you think, well, I'm so wise. Hey, look at the type of stuff you do when you're so wise. The things that we might say to one another, the actions we might take, the way we might have talked to our children there. And if it weren't for the grace of God and their resiliency, we would have lost them long, long time ago. I think about those things because sometimes I know that I'm ungrateful. Sometimes I think it's because of my doing that things have gone well for me in my life. And it's when those types of things happen that I have to come before the Lord and say, change my heart, God. I don't, I don't, want, I don't want disaster to hit me just so that I can see how messed up I am. I, I, I'll believe you on that, God, you know. But we still have to ask God sometimes to change our hearts because we're really not grateful as we should be. And if we're not grateful, we're not going to be giving thanks out of an overflowing heart of gratefulness. It says here in verse 14, I'll give you the last point here. God gives grace to the humble. Now, it doesn't say that exactly in the text, even though there's a lot about glorious goodness, there's graciousness there, there's glorious splendor, there's uh, goodness, um, there's greatness, there's generation. There's all these words that start with G. When you get into 14 through 21 in the English Standard Version, there's not a lot translated that way. But I think what it's basically describing is how gracious God is. So God gives grace to the humble. Verse 14, it says, The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. So this idea of the, the Lord upholding all who are, are falling and raises up all who are bowed down is those who have somehow or another come to this point where their lives are maybe falling apart. They're coming to understand that, that they, they, because of distress and such that they're brought down low to even call upon the name of the Lord. But God holds those ones up. It says the eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You know, the fact that it happens that way is, is only because of God's grace, right? I mean, he tells us we'll have our seasons, and in, uh, what is it, uh, Lamentation chapter 3, it says those seasons will continue to go on, right, until they don't, right, until the end of the world. But, you know, they don't, they didn't, they don't have to. It's because of who God is. It's because of his goodness. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Verse 17 says, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. Verse 18, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. Is this not a picture of a gracious God? one who is merciful, one who is compassionate. As we call upon him, as people call upon him, as they cry out, he saves them. Does God have to do that? Does he? He doesn't. He chooses to because of his character. I would say he has to do it because he's true to his character. He can't, he can't deny how good he is. Right? That's kind of how God works, right? There's certain things that he does because of his character. So when we appeal to God, we can ask him, God, because you're good, do this for me. Because I need you to do this. And when I'm saying do this, it doesn't mean help me to win the lotto. That's not the type of goodness type of thing I'm talking about. You know, I bet on the Vikings playing today. Yeah, I bet on the Vikings, God, I need them to win. No, not like that, you know. But different things, you know. And because of that, we can appeal to God because of his character for sure. 
But he does these things because of his goodness here. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Who is the wicked? In theory, all of us would be the wicked if we didn't repent from our sin. We would all be the wicked. We would all be worthy of destruction. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, verse 21. And let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. As, Jake, as David wrote this, you know, verse 1, he said, I will extol you, my God and king. You know, in the other, um, other psalms, you'll usually find here, it talks about uh, my God and, and king, uh, my God and, and king. Here it talks about my God, and actually it's missing here, but it's my God and the king. And David has a personal relationship here with God. He's directing his praise towards God. He's directing this song towards God. It's a personal type of thing. And you know what's funny is, uh, as I mentioned kind of briefly earlier and just touched upon, Psalm 146, 147, 148, 149, and 150 all begin with the word praise the Lord in English, hallelujah in Hebrew. So that David started off with, you know, this tehillah, this this, uh, I will praise the Lord, and the next five chapters, the end of book, talk about praising the Lord. The actual last verse of Psalm, of the book of Psalms says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And David is not uh, uh, given, he's not uh, the author of 146, 7, 48, 49, and 50. So somehow or another, somehow or another, that, that came along got added to the book, and that became the closing of it all. Why? Because God is worthy of our praise. God is good enough for it all. And so sometimes we have to wrestle with his goodness when we're struggling with our own things here. We have to see how good God is. We have to see that things that he didn't have to do, he's done. Ways that he's provided for us, he doesn't have to do, but he does. Why? Because he's good. Because his greatness is unsearchable. We don't understand everything about God. And rightly so. We shouldn't. He's God and we're not. But what we can understand about him, we should give him praise for that because of his greatness, because of his mighty works, because of his glorious goodness. And if we struggle with anything, we can come before God because he knows our hearts anyway. And we can ask him to change our hearts so that we offer what we offer to him is truly worthy of who he is. As he is my God and my king, New Testament times says that we get to know God through his son, Jesus Christ. You can talk about God in the general. You can talk about God in the impersonal. But you cannot talk about my God and my Lord unless you know him through his son, Jesus Christ. And that means humbling ourselves, crying out. It says he hears their cry and saves them. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. There's a principle that says God gives grace to the humble. And if we will humble ourselves, he will grant us forgiveness of our sins if we would call to him and ask him for that. If we need anything in our lives, any change of attitude where we don't measure up with God's holy standard, and there's plenty of places for that, we can come before God, and in Jesus Christ, he will accept us. In Jesus Christ, he will bring about transformation in our lives as well to make us more and more like Jesus because that's what God wants to do, conform us to the image of his son. David is known as a man after God's own heart. Jesus comes through the line of David, if you follow the genealogy there. If we're going to be after God's own heart too, it needs to be filled with praise to God. If we don't have a a praiseful heart, we can ask God to change that so that we can praise our great God for his glorious goodness. Let's stand, and I'll dismiss us.
Heavenly Father, we thank you that you remind us of your goodness. You remind us of your mighty acts as it's described here in your word, of your works, O God, your creative works, your salvific works, Lord. You brought about salvation. Now is the day of salvation, you tell us in your word. You brought that about through your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that we might have the forgiveness of sins, that we might have eternal life, Lord. The hope and the promise to be with you in eternity. As we live this eternal life, even now, Lord, we start, and we know that the way it works as believers, that death is a transition into eternity. That as we deal with the the heaviness sometimes that we face in life, that we can call upon you and you can make our burdens light. Lord, many times the things that burden us in our lives are actually things that have caused us to come and appreciate your goodness more and more, to see things more clearly as they truly are. And so as hard as it is to do that, sometimes we thank you for that. We pray, Lord, that as you continue to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ, that we would be people who are filled with praise, always giving thanks to you, God, because you are worthy of our praise and you are worthy of our thanks. And so this morning, Lord, we thank you that you have brought us here. And we pray now that as we depart from this place, that you would be honored with our response to your word, Lord, that we would live this week with a grateful heart. And if for some reason or another, we might be struggling with that, that we might turn to you, call upon you, and experience afresh, Lord, your goodness, your renewing power. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Be with us now and help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we depart from this place, so that Christ might get all the praise and all the glory, which is rightly Jesus's. Amen. This has been a ministry of the Grace Bible Church. If you're looking for a church home, or you would just like to come and visit, please be assured of a warm welcome. Our Sunday school begins at 9.45 and the morning service at 10.45.